Hi guys, welcome to another All Ball Special. With me today, I have a very special guest, someone who's living everyone's childhood dream, mine for sure, a face to 700 million viewers around the world, a host of the biggest league in the world. I'd like to welcome Manish Basin on the show. Manish, how is it going? How are you? Hey, Raul, I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Uh, you find me with UK in uh, lockdown three, a pretty similar situation I know to many countries around the world. Uh, we're trying to deal as best as we can, hoping obviously those most vulnerable are keeping safe at this time, um, but adjusting to a new way of life. But you know, um, the Premier League is keeping me going right now. I think it's keeping us going as well. Also, actually, you know, it was it was it was kind of a bummer when it went off in the middle, but we we're really glad to have it back. Um, not so much for the players, but I think for the viewers, a smaller summer gap was you know it was good because we were back on track with the football. So that was a great thing around, you know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, if anything, I think that smaller gap has basically played a major part in this season being so exciting. So many unpredictable results. Um, I think the players, if you ask them, uh, they don't mind having such a short preseason. I think the managers clearly are more concerned about the fitness levels and we are seeing one or two injuries. But on the whole, I just think what's gone on trying to get the protocol in situation. I think Project Restart helped the Premier League to know how to cope with this new non-fan environment, trying to make things as sterile as possible. But we go again, but, you know, I suppose away from all the protocols and the kind of new way of having to work, I just think, that, you know, the, the, the extra kind of interesting, fascinating elements to the Premier League just keeps us, uh, you know, once again, just glued to our screens. It's it's actually it's amazing and also that the fact that you know the games are so close to each other. I mean, again, not sure the managers are too happy about it, but as viewers, we're absolutely thrilled because we have football, you know, week long. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes thick and fast. It's for me. I feel first first of all very lucky. I have a wife who's a surgeon, so obviously she's a key worker. Um, she's doing along with all of her kind of colleagues with the health service with people around the world such a crucial job. I kind of feel a bit of a phony because broadcasters are also classified as key workers. So we are still going to work and obviously we are still having to social distance in the studio. Um, but to be able to bring the Premier League to the viewers around the world, for me, brings so much pleasure. I mean, I've been doing it for nearly 20 years now. And, you know, I started very young and to be able to continue doing it, I mean, so easily this thing could have been shut down and we could have been doing nothing. I could have been at home helping my kids do their online schooling. But it's great. Um, it's invigorated everybody's interest. And, you know, in many ways, it's like people are looking for external in, uh, kind of factors to keep their routine going. But when games are coming thick and fast and I'm in the studio, if not today, the next thing I'm on Tuesday, I look at the rotor. I'm in with um, Ian Wright, a good friend of mine, and Alan Shearer. Uh, and then it just makes you wonder look ahead to the next match day. And, and before you know it, you've done three shows in a week, two match weeks have gone, and we're, we're already over halfway past this season, which is just, you know, almost in the blink of an eye from the start of the season to Christmas is the slow burner kind of situation. Once you get past the new year, that's when things get really, really interesting. And before you know it, it'll be March and April. We're into the, the run-in, and then it's all down to, you know, who's leading at the top and who's doing all their best to stay in the league for next season. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, for us, because we try to cover the pre and the post for every game week and it's, this they're just so close to each other. Yeah. It's a task, you know, but it's fun. It's, it's that excitement, it's that passion that, you know, just keeps it alive. But uh, we're going to talk a lot, you know, about football. But before that, Manish, I want to talk, you know, a little bit about you, you know, how you got in. Because like I said, initially, it's, you're living a dream, you're living my dream, of course, you know, you're, you're presenting the Premier League to the world. So just a little insight on you know, how you got started. What pushed you to you know, get into football? Well, look, I'm living my dream. Um, when I know um, it's quite typical of many Asian kind of uh, parents to want to drum into their kids, go into more secure kind of uh, professions. You know, when I'm talking about, I'm in my, in my mid forties now. And I know that's hard to believe by the way. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, People want to go down the lawyer route, the solicitor route, the kind of doctor, dentist or whatever. For me, working and doing stuff behind the scenes when I'm preparing is basically just ringing managers and players and scouring a bit of the internet. And that's me kind of instead of number crunching as an accountant. So, yeah, I feel lucky. Now, 
it started when I was 14. Um, when you're doing something called your O levels or GCSEs in this country, um, you get given a week's work placement and you have to go about, um, maybe it's with your dad's kind of solicitor firm or your mum's kind of doctor receptionist job or whatever. And uh, I uh, just had this idea that I'm going to call the local radio station and I'm going to write to them and say, look, listen, I've got this, I have to just spend it with you. And I did. Uh, and I followed the sports editor around. And at Radio Leicester, and we have local towns and obviously it's cities in the UK. Each one has a local BBC radio station, so BBC London, BBC Nottingham. But where I grew up in Leicester, which you might have heard of after what happened five years ago, <laughs> uh, I went there and basically I was gobsmacked to meet the guy who was the voice of football for Leicester City, which is a team that I grew up loving and supporting and still do. Uh, during the winter and then during the summer, the same guy would then commentate on all the cricket games for Leicestershire Cricket Club, where Sivag and Kumble all came to play as overseas players from India. And I thought, I want that guy's job because this is the best thing ever. And I've always been sports mad. Give me a ball from the age of three and I'll do something with it. Give me a bat and I'll be outside for five, six hours. Um, and basically, I geared my life to getting that guy's job. So I went back, did my A-levels after O-levels, did a one undergrad degree, did a postgrad degree, all geared towards journalism, um, and got that guy's job essentially nine, ten years later. Um, and so things went in my favour in that, you know, uh, when you work on radio, voice is everything. Uh, I might, I, 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 you know, uh, it was something that I was given to me. I was just lucky. If I didn't have a decent voice, maybe radio wasn't my thing. Um, but radio was something that I always wanted to do. And then that was it. Um, but to help me kind of grow into becoming um, a presenter, I actually started working on Asian radio. So I was presenting um, with a senior presenter as at 16 years of age for two or three years, um, a request show, music request show. So guys in Leicester and Birmingham, listeners would, um, I can tell you, they'd want to listen to all sorts of music. If it's Bhangra, Hindi uh, film music, guzzles, budgeons, whatever, for a two hour radio slot on a BBC radio station in Leicester, we'd play to the whole Midlands. And I had this squeaky little unbroken voice, uh, which made me want to help play these songs with the presenter and have a bit of fun on air. Um, and so that was it. And that's when my love of Bollywood came in as well, actually, um, because I can tell you every film from the 1980s onwards. Um, because of all the songs of that of that era. But that was then. And then obviously I went into local TV, uh, local radio, local TV, national TV. And now here I am kind of globally doing what I do. And yeah, I do feel very lucky. Um, I've made some good friends. Uh, I, you know, I'm not one of those guys that kind of, I like to stay pretty humble. It's something that my dad drummed into me very, very early on. Um, and so, yeah, I take nothing for granted. It's, it's, it's actually amazing because when you said, you know, you wrote into the BBC team, I mean, there's a similar situation here where, you know, we were in lockdown and I write into Davis and Scott and I'm like, you know, this is a blog I've written on the Derby and they call me back and they're like, okay, we're planning to do this video podcast. So, you know, why don't we do this together? So, you know, can you, can you describe to me the atmosphere in the studio? Because there, these are some big names and, you know, there's, those are big games they're talking about. It's funny, I, I see them less as kind of the legends, more as just people now. Uh, and it's something that you become more and more used to. So I used to present a program called Football Focus here. Then we used to have all sorts of big names in. Um, you know, your Beckhams, your Mourinho's, your Wenger's. And over the years, you just get to know these guys because you see them at games. And now I see Ian. There's just so much energy. There's such a great atmosphere. We had Michael Richards in last week for the first time, I think, for a match day. Well, I had him and Ian. And I have to say, the energy in that room for those two, and that was the first time I'd worked with Micah. But when I walked into the room, into the green room, where we all kind of have a bit of a coffee and um, kind of a socially distant chat, um, these guys will often say, Manish, it's like I know you because I've watched you for years here in, uh, in the UK. Um, I had the same with Leanne Sanderson, who obviously is a former kind of Arsenal striker, uh, England women's uh, footballer. And it's great because it breaks the ice. Uh, I meet a lot of these guys at the kind of PFA Awards, which I've hosted over the years. And that's another kind of dream come true moment. So for these guys, you've got to wipe away the fact that, you know, it's Michael Owen. This is a guy who's, you know, played for the top teams in the Premier League. I mean, he's 
bridge that divide between United and Liverpool. He's gone around Madrid. He's, you know, Ballon d'Or and the rest of it, the goal scorers. He's scored at Euros and World Cups. But to me, he's just Michael. And yeah, you've got to remember that these guys have done what they've done. But if you let that legendary status get in the way of what you want to do in the studio, I think you won't really get the best out of them. And I just think you need to just try and keep it real in many respects. And um, I always look forward to just the, the different the dynamics between different pundits. You know, so you'll have a Tim Sherwood in who I know likes to chuck in beyond a uh, hand grenade. And, and that's brilliant because we love that kind of thing. And we all bounce off it. Ian brings his energy. Uh, until he gets hungry, by the way, that's when he gets a little bit grouchy. Um, but uh, I just think they're brilliant. I think they're all great. And the fact that I've been to India a couple of times and Hong Kong for various conferences and um, Asian summer tournaments uh, with Shearer and Wrighty, Schmeichel. I just think again, you get them out, you socialize with them you get to see a different side. And it's, it, it, you kind of generate this kind of, what well, I'd like to think, some kind of mutual respect. And I'm hoping that that kind of comes across in the studio. Absolutely. I mean, you've spent, you spend quite a lot of time with them, you know. So while, like you said, you bounce off them, you, you know, you grab their energy in the studio. I want to know what happens before, you know, what is your prep when you leave the house, before you walk into that green room? How do you prep for these big games? Uh, do you know what? Um, I will always be guilty of over-prepping. I don't think you can ever um, be ready for, I suppose, for any job. This goes for anything, really, even for exams. It's something that gets drummed into you by your parents. Um, you know, failing to prepare is preparing to fail and all the rest of it. I think there's no kind of truer kind of saying. Um, I will always... The thing is, with the Premier League, it's because... It, it's globally so much there's so much interest you can just log on to the internet you can get to well um, kind of researched websites that will help you in your research like I said you contact and you talk to people directly just to get into what's going on at each and every club the one thing that's kind of where I learned a lesson about preparation was when I was doing something called the football league show uh, on the BBC uh, for six years where it had nothing to do with the Premier League. This was all about the, the, the lower league clubs. You know, the clubs that 95% of the world would have no interest in, apart from that one or 2,000 fan base. I'm talking about your Tranmere Rovers, your Rochdales, your Rotherham Uniteds. And I had to talk about these guys on a weekly basis for six years. And you get one thing wrong about any of these teams and those fans will be on to you. And you know what social media is like. And unfortunately, we're seeing examples now where supporters are taking it a bit too far from then on you just realize you've got to get everything right um formations um kind of squad permutations um players strengths players weaknesses you basically become a real life football manager um because you're having to but in a way listen it's not my job to be the expert on football my job is to ask the questions because being a football fan helps to ask the right questions all I need to do is get that information out of those guys. So for me, I like to pride myself on pretty short, sharp, concise questions. I don't like to make almost the questions as long as the answers. The guys are there for the answers, and that's my job. And that basically kind of harks back to kind of, you know, becoming a, a training to be a journalist. That's where you kind of learn these things over time. That's, that's actually something, you know, I should keep in mind because of, you know, the shows and the interviews we do. But yeah, it's amazing to hear all these things. Coming back to, like I said, you know, we will talk football. Uh, the biggest point of conversation in the studio, I think, you know, which you have with the guests and probably we have with the boys here, is the VAR. So, and, you know, lately we've heard Michael Owen on the show following the Manchester City Asimila game and how the rule changed. So how is it, you know, and then you also have someone like Mr. Gallagher join in and explain these things where obviously, you know, Michael Owen, Owen Hargreaves, Ian Wright, they're not on board with this. So how, how is that atmosphere when the VAR is being discussed? Raul, I'll be honest with you. I think Dermot quite enjoys the jousting um, with the guys in the studio. Uh, he's, he's there not really as somebody who's, you know, fiercely protective of VAR. He's there to interpret the rules. And if there's been a mistake... I think he will tell us 
Um, he'll be very diplomatic and that's his job because I think we all want the game to be um, uh, not affected in terms of speed, but we want the right decisions. Uh, I think a lot of people know why VAR has come into place. There might be a few kind of you know, you know, uh, disagreements as to the way it's been implemented, but I think now it's here, we have to try and get on with it. And whether we like the kind of minutiae details of an onside, offside decision is one thing. But when there is a whole new discussion to be had for uh, Rodri's involvement in Bernardo Silva's goal, then, you know, I think it actually makes the game a lot more kind of um, kind of uh, enjoyable to talk about. And, it, you know, we're talking about it now. Uh, and I know it can have, when we've got our fan hat on, make us pulling our hair out. And it, don't get me wrong, if Leicester have, are on the wrong side of a VAR judgment, I'll be in this room kind of like, you know, jumping up and down like a bit of a madman. But, um, but we, go, we go with it, you know. But, you know, I want to know if, Personally, you're in favor or not? Because we had we had a show where one of my co-hosts, you know, he had he had a line which actually made sense that if we wouldn't have the hand of God if there was VAR. Yeah. So, are you in favor? Are you not in favor, or is it still you know a middle ground? Well, you're talking to a British Asian guy about the hand of God. So, come on, the fact that it happened in I guess England, I think it was disgraceful. Um, it was an amazing goal. I mean, the run was great. But the finish was unbelievable, and it didn't. Obviously, we all the England fans felt short change at the time, um, and we have seen you see big examples of handball goals, like obviously Thierry Henry, um, Republic of Ireland when he was playing for France. These major moments, and I think VAR. I think the essence of VAR is a good thing. It's just how far we take it. That's, I think that's what we're trying to get to grips with. I'll be brutally honest, like I mentioned just a moment ago, now that VAR is here, it's not going to go away. It's here to stay. But you can see where certain rulings are now having to be slightly micromanaged or changed. I think this is an inevitability of trying to work with the technology and once we get over this bumpy couple of years since its inception, I think 99% of the viewers will get on board with it. And I just think we're going through what I feel is almost an inevitable teething period with it because it's highlighting many gray areas in the game that VAR can and cannot do. Um, and my hope is, I think once these have been dealt with, and I don't really like the fact that we've got mid-season rule changes. It doesn't feel right. Or you don't want changes. You just want clearances. You want clarity. You want someone to say, actually, this should be interpreted this way. Once everybody knows which way we're going with every each and every uh, bit of rule, and of course, there's lots of laws when it comes to the game of football, I'm hoping then we can move forward properly. Yeah, because there was this, you know, like Mike Logan called it. He called it after the Aston Villa game uh, where... Yeah. You know, there was a, a little tweak in the offside rule. So, I mean, I watched that complete show and, you know, he was quite he was quite agitated about it. But again, you know, coming to Michael Owen, you have someone, you know, who's represented United, represented Liverpool, like you mentioned in the past. Mm. Uh, you have an Ian Wright on the other side. So what is the atmosphere like, you know, for a United Arsenal or a Liverpool Arsenal, considering you have fans, you know, supporting one team? Okay, well, this is interesting because you have um, some footballers who still, once retired, they still live for football and they love football. Others, actually, they have other interests. They have, you know, um, they've moved on from the football. Although they love it, they're there to cover it. They're not there as fast. But Ian, for example, is an out-and-out -out Arsenal fan. Um, when Arsenal score, he goes crazy. Um, if if it's a good game of football, Michael Owen will be less tribal. He'll be more applauding over quality of a pass or quality of a finish. Um, but then I suppose that almost that's almost reflect, reflected of the kind of the, the way fans perceive Michael having gone from Liverpool to United because you know obviously that was a big move and he you know some fans feel rejected by the fact that he did that. Um, 
So Michael has a more kind of generic view and he'll be equally pleased for whoever scores, whether it be Liverpool or Manchester United. And that's just the way he is. Um, Atlan Shearer, you know, again, tribally, he is black and white through and through. He is a massive Newcastle fan. And so when Newcastle score and I'm with him, it's like watching it with a Newcastle fan. And I love that. And that's brilliant. And particularly when they're playing against Leicester, then obviously there's a bit of an added bonus because then I like to kind of dig these guys or kind of like, you know, prod them a bit when we've taken the lead. And they, they know how to wind me up because I get quite easily wound up. So, um, but yeah, no, there's, but, the, but like I said, each individual kind of responds differently to when their old team scores. And, you know, while you have to be neutral throughout all of this, when you're watching the game at Leicester... On camera, goes, only on camera. <laughs> Because when we're showing a goal rush game, maybe, or one of our feature games is Leicester, honestly, even the guys in the gallery, they have to turn their um, their earphones down a bit because I go a little bit crazy. So so, so that's how Manish is when, you know, Leicester scores in the studio. Yeah, without doubt. Even my girls say to me, they don't like it when I'm watching, when they're watching Leicester with me, it gets a little bit too, uh, I get a little bit too agitated. <laughs> No, but I mean, that's good, right? We all have that passion in us and we all have that little boy in us, you know, who'll get excited when your team scores. So it's, yeah. it's, it's all part and part of the game. Yeah, you know, I think the moment I lose that, I, will, I won't enjoy football as much. I, I literally shed tears when Leicester won the title and it felt such an alien thing to do to cry over football, but it felt the most natural thing to do at the time. Um, and yeah, I just want that. To, I just always want that to happen. I just, I, I, I want it to prick me when things don't work. And, and I have to obviously then take a, a step back when I know I've got to interview Jamie Vardy or I've got to go and interview Brendan. Um, and they, they all know, by the way, that I'm a Leicester fan. There's, 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 um, yeah, there's no denying that. So, okay, Manish, moving on, you know, I have some questions about you in the studio who for you is you know your funniest co-host or your funniest uh, pundit in the studio i think i probably mentioned him a couple of times already um right he's up there uh i think ian's fantastic um he's he's just you know he's he's like a he's like a fanboy um he he loves arsenal um he talks about everything in great. He talks like a supporter, but what I like about Ian is there is a serious edge to him because I think some people take him too lightly sometimes and that, you know, he always gets carried away, but when he has a point to make, I think he does it brilliantly. Um, he's up there as being one of the guys uh, I've always enjoyed Phil Neville, but now obviously it looks like he's gone to pastures new. Um, but also Tim Sherwood says it how it is. And, He's not afraid to say the odd controversial thing, which as a presenter is obviously kind of kind of what, what, what we're after, what we like to bounce off. Um, yeah, I, I like all of them. I, I like, the, the, I'll mention the word dynamics as well, because they all bring something different to the table. Um, you can have Paul Scholes, who, like Michael, isn't so animated, but when they speak, and they want to get something off their chest. They don't have to raise their voice, but you can you can tell their frustration. You can tell their anger that maybe something's not gone United's way or Liverpool's way. Um, but yeah, you know, if I had to pick one, I mean, that's a difficult one. But Wrighty would would definitely be up there with 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 your Tim Sherwoods. And you know, one pundit who will go for the team rather than you know just be neutral. I know. Well, that's right to, yeah, for sure. Um, Alan Shearer is the other one who, uh, Alan's great actually, because he's got this presence about him. You can probably get that in the, in the, from the studio. Um, he looks like that kind of no nonsense kind of pundit, but he's, he's got this, he's got this ability now where he can let go a little bit. He can have a joke at Newcastle's expense, which he knows hurts, <laughs> hurts him particularly badly. But he's he's more than willing to have a joke, and um, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to having those two in on uh, in a few days' time because I think those two bounce off each other very well. They they become the regular faces on match of the day on a Saturday night, which is obviously a kind of a, a, a long going fixture of, um, of football television in the UK. So 
um, they've developed a fantastic on-air relationship as well as off-air because they get on so well together as former strikers and um, you know they, they know what it's like in the heat of the battle. Also, you know, before we get into our next segment, I want to ask you about this season. You know, how do you think it's going to pan out? Your top four, your title contender, probably oh. the bottom three. <laughs> You know, it's not my job to make predictions. It's normally my job to ask the guys to make their predictions. It's, of all the seasons, I think you're on a hiding to nothing to try and make a prediction because it's, it's going in so many different ways. The fact that we've had the tie, the lead at the top change hands nine times and when we're at the halfway point of the campaign, it's just ridiculous. We've seen, obviously, City concede five at home. Uh, we've seen um, Villa hit Liverpool for seven, which I still can't get my head around. Um the big games seem to have kind of all finished all square, you know, the big six clashes. Um, we saw it recently um, between Arsenal and Manchester United. And it feels, I think, that the undercurrent is that Manchester City are clearly prov- getting a bit of momentum. The fact that they've now done something they've never done before in their history, despite what they've done for the last three years, has been phenomenal. The f- yeah, they've won 12 games in all in all competitions in a row, and that's quite... You've got to sit up and take notice. It's quite ominous. They are clearly kind of finding some real momentum. And I just think they're going to take some stopping. And I think that my easy answer to that is whoever finishes above City will finish top of the table. And right now, City are the favourites. Um, Liverpool have perhaps over, overcome that slight blip, which I think surprised many people without scoring for four or five games. And um, yeah, I just... <sighs> Consistency is the key, isn't it? It's whoever can be the most consistent in an inconsistent season. Um, City have got that. Manchester United had it up until recently. Liverpool had it up until recently. Leicester is showing it now. Um, Chelsea under a new manager. What can you know, Tuchel do? Um, do we rule out Tottenham? I just think those two the greatest resources will finish at the top. Um but of course, my heart says something very different. So, uh, yeah, let's see. In terms of the other side, Sheffield United have given themselves what to do just when they've beaten United and they've maybe started showing glimmers of hope of fighting back and trying to claw back uh, that 10 point deficit after only losing by a goal to Manchester City. Um, West Brom Fulham, I think that recent game between the two of them finishing in a draw was the worst possible result for both of those sides. And yeah, I just think if any team's going to get out of it, I think Fulham have got the best chance. I would have said Newcastle were the ones who might fall into it, but suddenly, out of nowhere, they yeah. pick up this win uh, at Everton. So, you know, it's it's not straightforward. I can't give you a straightforward answer. I even asked Eddie Howe this question uh, yesterday and off air, and even he said, you know, I just, you can't. I mean, you know, he's been there, he's done it. He's managed in the Premier League. He knows the bigger squads will clearly over a longer period of time come good. So then that obviously inevitably points its finger at your cities, your Liverpools, um, Manchester United. But then number four, Chelsea, Tottenham, Leicester. Who knows? Is Yeah, I mean, you know, Manchester City over the last years had the problem of conceding too many goals. So they're not doing that right now. They're keeping a lot of clean sheets and they've just got the momentum. You know, they're way clear on the points. Leicester probably the closest to catching them. So they're in with a good chance. So Manish, you ask all the questions. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot. While you you said Manchester, I still want to know one name from you of who's going to pick that title up. Say again, sorry, Rahul, ask that question again. I'm saying, you know, you've given us various possibilities of, you know, who's in contention, but I'm going to yeah. put you on the spot and I'm going to get one team from you who you think is going to win the title. Sissy. I think right now, Sissy, really although I just, I, I, I get the impression though, uh, am, are you a Man U fan? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the thing is, United for me, I mean, if you compare the two 11s, the starting 11s, I think you can see that there is a bit of a chasm in uh, kind of, in, uh, in kind of standard, not, not particularly in the forward line, 
for me, it's about the defense. And I'm just yet to be fully convinced with this current back four that United have got a title winning defense. That is my only thing. Um, I know about Harry Maguire, obviously, you know, from his Leicester days and while he wasn't with us for too long, I know what he can, um, when he can bring, but I also know that, you know, who you should, who United need alongside him is one Basaka, the kind of fullback you need as a defender. I think he's excellent going forward. There's question marks. Luke Shaw, I think, is having actually a renaissance season. I think he's doing really well. But it's Maguire's partner. Do Lindelof and Bailly are either of these part of a title-winning backline? I'm, I'm not sure. I, you know, I'd like to say yes, but I just think that's one of. The, I think that's one of the key areas. I think United just falls short compared to City. I think we're getting wrapping our heads around that as well. You know, it's the defense. It's you know, just considering that we have to come from one nil down every game is kind of a concern right now. Yeah, you can't keep doing that. I mean, it's 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 laudable that you've done it seven times in the league this season, but you know, it's unsustainable and it will catch up with you as it did against Sheffield United. So, um, yeah. Those are the signs you look out for, isn't it? You've just, uh, as outsiders looking in, you can only just take away from these aspects of the game that falling behind is never a good start. But while it's great, you're showing spirit. I think loads of people are saying, oh, this is the Fergie spirit from back in the day. I think Solskjaer was almost quite tired of that. This is a new era. And it is a new era. It's a totally different set of players, different mindset, different mentality. So I don't think you can jump to too many conclusions. I mean, while I agree with you that, you know, Manchester City do look favourite somewhere in my heart, I just feel that United's going to catch them somewhere. Actually, you know what? I, I, I'd i like to see United um, part of the mix to the very end. I do want to see that because it's been a while and nobody wants to see a one-horse race. Uh, I think Liverpool did that um, last time round. And so it's like City will forever be in the mix. We need others there as well. More the merrier. It's great for the neutral. Um, you know, and I think a good United is always a good story. Um, my only problem with United is I just think sometimes uh, some of their fans I hear from almost feel a little bit entitled that we are Man U, we should be up there. Well, maybe according to history, but if your squad's not good enough, then what makes you feel that you should be up there? So, you know, I think every team goes through peaks and troughs and it looks like United are obviously on their way up under Solskjaer uh, after a very sticky period, but um, they're on the right track. But you know how to, we don't know right now. Well, hopefully we'll know end of the season. Manish, I am now going to share, you know, some images with you, and you know, just want you to take us through what those images meant to you. So that's the first one. You know, it was like I was talking about. You shared the studio with so many different pundits. The Owen Hargreaves and Michael Owen, yeah. I mean, that's I mean, those two are great, you know. Actually, I think Owen Hargreaves' reading of the game is very good. Um, he's he's one of um one of the pundits I enjoy certainly having on. And again, we're trying we're trying to keep socially distant because this is the, the way of the new world. And uh I was almost struggling to get the three of us in this selfie. So that's why Michael Owen was having to kind of almost cow down behind me, which was quite funny. Um the other recently. Uh, like I mentioned, we had Micah Richards in, who, who who's so infectious with his personality and character. We loved having him on. I mean, he's he's been a very popular pundit in the UK across a lot of many different programs. But to get him and Ian together, I felt made for a really, really energetic, insightful show. And I thought I thought uh, that was one of the actually highlights for this, this season for me. Um, which is why I wanted to take a picture of the three of us just to kind of um, just to kind of one for remember. That, that, that was a that was a really enjoyable evening and you know talking about the energy in the room we have four players in the back on screen who are having an absolute amazing season yeah. personally yeah brilliant i mean suchek look at him i can't believe what he's doing for midfield and the fact that he only costs something like 16 to 20 million pounds um he's been brilliant um gundawan he's having the time of his life uh rafinha's done well but uh, saka the teenager is just, 
he's off the scale right now. It's just such a shame. I think Arsenal missed him against uh, Manchester United. He was he was a big loss. Okay, we we'll move on to our next one. Uh, probably the two best managers in the Premier League right now. Yeah. Now this was an uh, interesting uh, evening. At both of these events actually these were a year apart. Pep got both in Hong Kong as it happened. Um, for the Premier League Asia Trophy Tournament, which we cover kind of almost as a run-up to the actual Premier League season, um, doing a Q&A with Pep Guardiola, who was fantastic that night. He was in a great mood, um, in a social atmosphere. Uh, he, was, he was just having fun. I think um, they all have their own kind of duties to do uh, away, from the, away from the pitch for sponsors and whatnot. And this is, uh, you know, uh, some managers will find it a bit of a chore, uh, and it's quite hard work to get the best out of them. He was excellent that night. And actually, that's one of my favourite pictures, I have to say. Um, and obviously, Jurgen Klopp, um, when Liverpool were out there. And he um, that was an interesting time because the weather uh, in Hong Kong was particularly dreary. And there was a lot of fog and mist in the mornings. Training was not very conducive those conditions weren't conducive for training outside and I think he was getting a bit frustrated but on that night brilliant he was excellent we had um Tony Pulis next to him um we had Craig Shakespeare and we also had uh one other manager who just escapes me right now but he was excellent so just a little bit on these two gentlemen, you know, we've seen them on the field, we've seen them during the press match conferences. What are they like off camera? You know, what's their demeanor? What's their body language? Um, they're good in a social setting. Uh, uh, I think the, the feeling we have when we talk about these guys as managers, one is that Pep's very serious, very intense. Jurgen Klopp's the more jovial jovial one but I think if you talk to both of them one thing you notice is not just the love of the game and they eat sleep and breathe it it's the work they put in their tactical now is incredible wherever they've gone they've been hugely successful um, and I often ask footballers when I see them or pundits who would they rather play for and I think it's a really interesting kind of um split right down the middle um they know they'll it will be relentless under pep guardiola they say he talks about football all the time and we've seen that haven't we even with opposition players when they come off i think nathan redmond was one of them a couple of years ago where he goes over to the southampton winger and he's like telling him this is what you should have been doing this uh, you can see on the look on his face because i'm not even a city player but that's the kind of thing that's the kind of man pep's like he's just he's 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 so intense I think Jürgen might be less intense when it comes to kind of getting into the players and drumming, uh, drumming into them all the time. I think he's, he seems to be more of a, clearly from the hugger, uh, being as a hugger, the man, man management side of him, he, that's him more. I think people will say to me, oh yeah, I want to play for Jürgen Klopp because I want, to, I want that Klopp hug. I want that kind of arm around the shoulder approach. And I think there's, there's just very nuanced differences between the two of them. And I think, I think these two have just added so much more quality to the Premier League. I think they've been brilliant. Absolutely. I mean, completely agree with you. Our next one is a little away from football, but this is, you know, for our Indian fan base. Our former captain and our current captain take us through these. Um, so this was uh, a couple of years ago, or actually just maybe even last year. No, it might be a couple of years ago now. Um, India were here for a series um, and they did a, uh, a an evening event um, for, I think it might have been one of the uh, TV networks, Sony or Star, one of them. And we, some of us got invited to go and have a and a with these guys and... It was great to see them both, I have to say. I I used to cover cricket almost in a previous life for the BBC. I was uh, at the Wankhede Stadium when Dhoni hit that incredible six 
against Sri Lanka in the final to win the World Cup final. So I covered that for BBC TV in the UK. And, you know, for somebody of, you know, Indian roots and background, I'm very proud of it. I mean, I have to say the fact I felt so lucky to be there. And I said to him, um, you know, I was there for that moment. And he, he was, you know, he was, he was very chatty and he was excellent. And I mean, you know, what, what a loyal servant, what a quality player. Uh, anybody who keeps wicket and bats to the degree that he does and captains, it's just, it's just quite incredible. Um, Kohli, I don't have much of a history with, but I, I wanted to say hi to him because for me, in many respects, he's almost like the Indian David Beckham. I mean, he's, he's kind of, um, you know, you know what I mean by that? He, he's like box office. Um, he's got the looks, the skills, he's got the flair. And I went over to him and I kind of spoke in my very poor Hindi, uh, you know, about who I was. And obviously in India, I just come to this realization that nobody speaks Hindi anymore. Everybody speaks English. <laughs> um, and he said, he, he said to me, I said to him, look, I present for the I present Premier League games in India. You, you might not know. And he said, yeah, I've seen you. When someone like Kohli says, yeah, I watched you on TV and Harbhajan said the same thing when I met him uh, that day, it just made me think, you know, it was a bit of a kind of grounding moment that you realize just uh, how widespread the kind of the, the kind of global viewership is of the Premier, and just it was good to chat with him. Um, I wish him the best of luck, and it was a good night actually. It was you know uh, there was a bit kind of it was a bit of everything. There was a bit of uh, entertainment, a bit of music, and um, but it was all kind of a, a, around the cricket. And I love my cricket. Um, I've played against uh, I've played for a kind of a, a UK um, media eleven uh, against a. Uh, not a cine glitz eleven, but I played against Saif Ali Khan and all sorts of other players, and it was very, it was very funny. Uh, and I had to bowl the last over to Kapil Dev, World Cup winning captain for India, and he needed eight off the last over. I bowled my googlies and uh, my kind of like leg spins, and you know what? He just toyed with me. He actually gave me the, the feeling that I had the chance of winning it for our team. There were six thousand people watching it, Headingley. It was an eye for eleven, actually. And um, two off the last ball, I bowled a googly and it pitched perfectly where I wanted it to. <laughs> Obviously went the other way to what Kapil was expecting. And then he just took his time and just stroked it for four. But he looked at me and he just went like that. And I was like, oh my goodness, I don't care if we lost the match. I just got that from Kapil Dev. That's me happy, I'm done. Uh, so yeah, no, no, cricket is a, is a big kind of love of mine as well as football. It's amazing. And uh, speaking of a big kind of love, you know, the next picture will bring back a lot of great memories for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh. It's, um, yeah, I mean, this takes on added meaning now. Um, so I became a fan from 12, well, no, even younger, but my first games were like from 12 to 14. Uh, because there was obvious, there was issues of racism of attending games in the UK back then, which obviously didn't make it conducive for my dad to take me and my my twin brother uh, to our first Leicester game. Um, and since Leicester won the title, I've lost my father. Which um, you know, I'm just so happy that he was around to see that moment um, because he knows what a big part of my life it was or is still, and for him as well because he was obviously the big. Um, the big influencing factor to take me to the games and obviously reflected in the fact that you look at Kun Vishai, um, who's no longer with us. Uh, it's been quite an, a, quite a journey since then. And yeah, I mean, that year was just, was on another level. And I'll tell you now, Raul, not only did we win the title, um, I got asked by the football team because I do a lot of their, uh, I used to do a lot of their corporate stuff. And they said, would you go on the open top tour of the city as the journalist to ask all the questions? And I was just like, wow, this day couldn't get any better. Or, you know, these, this moment couldn't get any better. That's it. So I was there with these guys. So I was the only guy or journalist uh, allowed on that bus. So I got an insight as to what it was like as somebody to win a Premier League title for the first time in 120 years and for half a million people to come onto the streets of Leicester it was just the most surreal day ever and just to be there it was just I had no right to be there but to be asked by the club 
to do those interviews. They then got obviously beamed around the world on different channels. Um, was just was amazing. And then I got off that bus, and unbelievably, um, Jamie Vardy, who I've obviously I know all these guys pretty well. Jamie just said, I just want to have a quick word. So I went over to see him and he gave me an envelope and I said, what's, what's going on? And he said, um, it's an invite to my wedding. Uh, so I ended up going to Jamie's uh, wedding. I went with my wife and, um, you know, you can imagine the, uh, the party at the reception was just, was, was brilliant. Just obviously, you know, kind of having a, a drink or two, uh, with a, a few of these guys was, was, was pretty special as well. So yeah, yeah I don't think you'll get any better than 15, 16. Absolutely, because I remember the video which, you know, was put out of Leicester players when Hazard scored against Spurs to win them the title. So yeah. that was that, that was quite, you know, something in itself. Oh, so it was, um, I, I took my little ones uh, and my wife, my father went uh, to the Everton game, uh, which was the final game of the season when Leicester were awarded the Premier League trophy. So when obviously those pictures you showed before, um they were they were literally there and it was so funny because my girls ever since are like uh you know does this happen all the time it's like no it's never happened before and i don't think it will ever happen again but you know having said that we're standing here with leicester who could possibly do it again but who knows yeah i mean they're in the running and they're playing some really good football even without yeah, 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 yeah. so that's that's yeah it's true i think technically they you could argue they're a better team this time around um so yeah, who knows? Could this happen again? That will be, you know, it was 5,000 to 1 chance of it happening last time. So I don't think it will ever be as big odds. This time. I think the bookies got their fingers well and truly burned. Can't rule it out though. But I do have to ask you though, which was your favourite goal from this season? Because I had mine and it wasn't the one where he scored against United. But <laughs> uh, what, any Leicester, That was the any... record goal. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, which was my favourite Vardy goal or any goal? Yes, any goal um, from that season. The 3-1 win at the Etihad Stadium when Riyad Mahrez jinked through um, a few players and then just basically slotted into the corner past them. Um, I, I think it was his right foot. It was a right foot shot. Yeah, 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 it was. It was an amazing goal. I mean, from that moment on... That's when I started to believe that we could do it. And that was, I think, only with about six, seven games left of the season. But up until then, when everybody was saying, this is Leicester's to lose, this is Leicester's to lose, I just thought, this, we're still going to somehow slip up at some point. But when that happened, I just thought, this is it. This is going to happen now. And yeah, he was great for us. Brilliant. I mean, for somebody who cost something like, I don't know, £600,000. Uh, yeah. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I still, I think two, a couple of goals. One where he curled one in against Chelsea. Yeah. So he he He's, went in and out of Aspilicueta. Yes. Kind of jinked on and the. And then he yeah. just put one. It, it was a typical kind of left-footed effort from him, but kind of. But he stood down a couple of players as well, from what I remember. Um, and the volley yeah. from Wadi against Liverpool was just unreal. Uh, over Minule. Yes. Yeah, but I think that was in our survival season, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that was at the end of the previous season. But history might have kind of, um, kind of, you know, kind of blurred between the two campaigns because obviously we went from being relegation survivors to then title winners, which was which was quite something. But you're right, that volley was ridiculous. Actually, that was one of the very first match day lives I'd done because. Um, uh, I was on with Owen Hargreaves and Andy Townsend. And that was, I remember distinctly looking at it, thinking, I just think, I, I don't think I'll ever see a better goal from a Leicester player. Um, but then we had a few to treasure after that, of course. I mean, you know, you had the N'Golo Kante, you had Mares, you had Vadi, but Okazaki, top left. I mean, not spoken about too much, but really important goals that season. You know, loved by, the, loved by his teammates. Um, loved by everybody behind the scenes at the club. Uh, one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. Um, as humble as they come. Um, and one of the hardest working players I think you'll, you'll ever come across. He was not afraid to run his heart out 
every game. And you're right. Um, history will point to Mares and to Vardy as being kind of like the key duo, but he was brilliant. He was so good. You know, he he scored a couple of overhead kicks. I think one against Newcastle, from what I remember, from close range. Um, people were just so happy. When he smiles, you can't help but smile as well. And he deserved his moment. It was, he was a great signing. All these kind of like random pieces of a jigsaw coming together to make a masterpiece. It was, it was amazing. And I think what really, you know, you can judge a player by when he's taken off. He always had a smile. He was never, you know, upset about going off. He knew he was playing for the team and he was just brilliant. Yeah. And, you know, you could also say he made, he, he kind of did half of Vardy's work for him. He ran, he ran in the, the channels. He, he took defenders with him. He gave Vardy the space to do what Vardy does. And from, you know, from, from, from start to finish, he was just, I think he was brilliant. And I, I think, yeah, he's definitely still playing. Uh, I'd love to see him again. It was just such a shame because you know what? His his English wasn't particularly fluent. And obviously because of the language barrier, you never really got into the heart of how he was feeling. And I just would love to have been able to get more into Shinji. I just think, you know, he was just such a wonderful human being. Um, and, and, he, and he will always be considered to be, you know, to be a legend. Um, and, and never forgotten, all of those guys, they've all got legendary status at, uh, in Leicester. Absolutely. I mean, that was a dream season. But yes, Manish, that brings us to the end. It was a pleasure. It was an absolute pleasure having a chat with you. But before I let you go, you know, I really want you to probably just give us some insight for hosts, podcasts, you know, video casts, other football channels like us as to, you know, what we can do better to probably get there one day. Well, look, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you've been great on this podcast. So, look, listen, I think just carry on along these similar lines. Uh, preparation is, like I've mentioned, key. Um, your love of the game will clearly shine because it's not something you can feign. Uh, it's either there or it isn't. Um, and if the longer you kind of see this more as not being a job and just being lucky to do it I think I think that's also quite that, that's quite that's quite key but as you've said already you wrote in or you got in touch with the guys you've been given a chance grab these chances with both hands make the most of what you can and put yourself out there this day and age of social media particularly during lockdown and pandemics people are going by social media a lot these days they're relying on it for content more than ever so now is a chance to make a name for yourself. And, you know, I, I wish anybody uh, all, all the will in the world. And I'd like to say that if you're good enough, you will be recognized. Um, I feel lucky to have kind of, you know, um, made the decisions that I've had, but also have people behind the scenes as well, um, helping me along the way. And, you know, I just wish you the way, uh, wish you the best. And, um, you know, long may it continue because uh, you're certainly going along the, the right track right now. Thank you so much, Manish. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. And, you know, on behalf of the team, thank you for taking out the time for us. And hopefully we'll have a chat soon. But until then, stay safe. And I hope everyone out there is safe during this time. Yeah, yeah. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Rahul.